Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Today we're going to shine a light on one of the most closed countries in the world. Most people outside of Central Asia know little about the gas-rich desert nation of Turkmenistan. The former Soviet Republic has virtually no independent media and just a handful of bookstores. Foreign journalists and scholars are rarely granted visas to visit. Even tourists who go to the country can visit only with a government-approved guide accompanying them. Turkmenistan has had just two presidents since the fall of the Soviet Union. Both have built bizarre North Korea-style personality cults and adorned the capital Ashgabat with giant golden statues of themselves. The incumbent, Gurbanguly Berta Mohamedov, has been in power since 2006, but he's up for re-election February 12 in what will be the country's first multi-party elections in its 26-year history. Many say the polls will be hardly democratic, but the election comes as Turkmenistan is facing new economic pressure as the price of its main export, natural gas, has tumbled in recent years. On today's edition of Global Journalist, a look at Turkmenistan in the final days of its presidential campaign. We've got some excellent guests to talk about this isolated country today. Up first is Victoria Clement in Washington, D.C. She's a research scholar at the Wilson Center who has lived in Turkmenistan and is working on a book about the country. Victoria, welcome to Global Journalist. Thank you, Jason. Well, Turkmenistan is fairly isolated. You did live there for a time. Tell us, just as an outsider, what struck you about the country during your first visits there? Well, it is a it is a quiet and, and fairly closed country. Um, there are only about five million people living there. It's very sparsely populated. But as you say, it is um, it does have a wealth of hydrocarbons. So the people do have subsidies that um, en enrich their, their lives and create a kind of um, relationship with the government that makes them, um, I think, en enjoy the status quo, which they'll be, I believe, voting for in this upcoming election that you mentioned. So in other words, things like food, water, health care, all that is subsidized heavily by the government. Yes. Uh, oil, gas, electricity, uh, water. Well, we talked a bit about Turkmenistan's last two presidents building personality cults about themselves. How is that visible on the ground in people's everyday lives? Well, as you mentioned, there are statues around the city. Um, some of the statues that the former president erected have been moved from the most central locations by the second president, Berdi Mohamedov, um, and nevertheless, they, they still stand. And Berdi Mohamedov has himself or his supporters ha has, have erected a um, statue to him in the main part of the city. In addition to that, there are um, portraits of the second president throughout the classrooms and official offices um, so his image is, is omnipresent and ubiquitous. And within Turkmenistan, how easy is it to get information about the outside world? How easy is it for you to communicate with people there about things like the upcoming election? Well, it is possible to, to communicate with people both via telephone and um, email. They do have some internet access. But I, I will say that people do engage in a fair amount of self-censorship. And even when I speak to people, I am careful when I ask them about things like the upcoming election to avoid anything that could possibly get them in trouble because the um, communications, especially with the outside world, are most likely monitored. And this is a place that was under Soviet rule for decades. Then for the last quarter century, it's been independent, but it's had this sort of rigidly controlled authoritarian government. From I mean, from what you were able to gather, uh, how do people there think about things like democracy and human rights? I'm not so sure that democracy in the way that we think of it is something that is at the forefront of people's minds in Turkmenistan. Um, there they're probably more focused, like like most people around the world, on basic everyday needs like um, good employment and good education for their children. There is no real um, movement for democracy and very little evidence of a civil society in Turkmenistan. Well, 
Our next question actually came from a Twitter user. Talk to us about the outlook of younger people in Turkmenistan. Now, obviously, the world has changed dramatically since the Soviet era. And just a couple years ago, we saw young people all across the Middle East sort of in the streets starting revolutions. Do, do younger people in Turkmenistan, do they sort of buy into this sort of strict authoritarian system? Or is there there's some dissatisfaction there? There is enough dissatisfaction that you do have people, um, young people, um, traveling abroad for study. So, for example, there's there are estimates of more than 40,000 students studying in other countries. But for those who live in the country, there there is a great deal of evidence that that, as I said, the status quo is something that that is um, accepted and and will persist. There is a um, a very quiet attitude in Turkmenistan toward um, the government and the the controls on the society. And we had another Twitter user ask us about the rights of women in Turkmenistan. Obviously, Turkmenistan uh, is a Muslim country. It does have a Soviet past. How are how are the rights of women? How have they changed over time? Well, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, for example, we saw women starting to enter the education system, um, and that increased exponentially over during the Soviet years, so that you see um, parity between men and women, boys and girls in education and the workplace in Turkmenistan, and that has does have something to do with the Soviet uh, legacy. But there's there's still a great deal of room for equality uh, between the, the genders. And this is ter- going to be Turkmenistan's first multi-party elections. Why do you think the government has chosen to go forward with allowing opposition parties to run in this upcoming poll? Well, we can't really call them opposition parties. Um, and it's not the first uh, multi-party election. There there were others that Berdi Mohamedov ran in um, in earlier years where there were other candidates. All those but, other candidates were from his own party, though, weren't they? Yeah, OK, yes. Um, th- so there are other candidates, uh, other parties running now. But um, they're not opposition candidates. They are um, people in the sense that we would think of um, these are people who have been handpicked by the regime who don't pose a real threat to Berdi Mohamedov. And the reason I believe that they're going through the motions of this election is in part so that Berdi Mohamedov can, can claim legitimacy and claim a popular mandate, both for internal consumption and external consumption. Victoria Clement, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. We're talking today about Turkmenistan, which will hold its first multi-party elections in its 26-year history this month. To expand our discussion, we're going to bring in three other people who follow events in Turkmenistan closely. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Mohammed Tahir of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. He's originally from Turkmenistan and hosts the network's Majlis podcast about Central Asia. In Charlotte, North Carolina, we're joined by Stephen Sable, a history professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, who has researched Turkmenistan for years. And in Glasgow, Scotland, is Luca Ancheski. He's a lecturer in Central Asian Studies at the University of Glasgow. Welcome to all of you. Let me start first with you, Luca Ancheski. How has Turkmenistan changed over the past nine years under President Berdan Muhammadov? Give us just sort of a a picture. For the worst. The, the country has not uh, undergone any substantial um, substantial change in terms of political uh, processes. There is no liberalization. The economy is still very much state controlled. And in fact, if the most significant change is that we are now registering the total failure of the energy policy of the regime. Uh, gas is the main export. Uh, but at the moment, the situation in which the, the policy has evolved led Turkmenistan to exporting only to China, which is problematic because we know that uh, the system of loans that uh, regulated the deal that was done with China, in fact, is bringing less and less money in. Okay, so I'm led- sorry. So you were saying that previously Turkmenistan had exported gas to a couple of other countries. I think it's Russia and Iran, but it lost those as customers. So it's become dependent on 
China essentially to buy its main export that funds much of its government, much of its services. Is that fair? That is correct. In January 2015, um, 2016, Gazprom withdrew from the Central Asian market, and later in December 20, 2016, so last month, uh, Turkmenistan and Iran decided to interrupt the bilateral trade gas gas deal which really leaves China as the only customers. Well, customer. well, let me back up here just a moment, because I think we want to come back to this issue about Chinese influence in Turkmenistan. But let me turn it to you, Stephen Sable. You know, one of the things that Turkmenistan is known for is this sort of cult of personality, which I think gets so much attention during the rule of its first president, Sapor Murat uh, Niyazov. He's, he's the guy who was named president for life. He officially changed the names of the months after himself and his mother. Uh, how did his rule sort of shape the country that Turkmenistan is today? Well, it created both the political and socioeconomic climate um, that the current regime has, although made some changes, it's, it's nonetheless um, continued uh, just with different actors, different characters involved. Um, it, it put... Turkmenistan really on the path of isolation, even though they call it positive neutrality, um, it's, it really doesn't have many friends in the world, and it's quite dependent on its uh, neighbors uh, or regional actors. Um, so Ryazov, unfortunately, uh, set Turkmenistan on this path of isolation, which he heralded as a virtue, but I think most observers would agree that it's created such an isolated uh, lonely state that without the goodwill of neighbors or other actors in the region, uh, Turkmenistan has, has struggled mightily since independence. And Mohammed Tahir, give us just an overview of the media environment there now. We are just days away from a presidential election. What does the news look like in Turkmenistan? Oh, news is the same, like uh, the state media uh, is functioning the way it's supposed to function. That is to, uh, you know, uh, uh, explain the state policy and praise the Ber President Berd Muhammadov in uh, his election campaign. The other candidates, who nine of them actually these days, uh, rarely gets any attention by the media. And so basically that's kind of a propaganda, uh, you know, platform for the state. So then uh, what you left with is just a few uh, outside organization to get information, like objective information, that one of them being uh, the Turkmen Service of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Actually, that's the only media which broadcasts to Turkmenistan in Turkmen language. Um, so, um, and uh, with, uh, uh, with regular uh, information coming out from inside of the country. So as election gets closer, as Turkmenistan is facing enormous uh, economic challenges, and uh, so our people are facing uh, kind of uh, consequences of that in a way that they are pressured uh, or uh, kind of blocked uh, in their... Yeah, I mean, how do your reporters for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Mohammed, how do they operate inside the country? Uh, they are operating like kind of uh, freelance reporters without accreditation, and that's because we requested n a number of occasions to get them accreditation. The authorities won't respond. And also, we asked for accreditation of our bureau. They would not respond to that question either. So they are kind of working on their own, providing information from inside. Actually, they are the only one doing that with enormous risks. Every time they file a report, which could be potentially critical of someone in, in the position of authority, they are questioned, they are intimidated, they are harassed. And as I speak today, two of them uh, are in jail. One is from last one and a half years. The other was uh, just uh, detained uh, last uh, December. Uh, we believe just because of their reporting, obviously, they have lots of other allegations. But uh, the main reason being that so the other who are working now, uh, three of them at the moment, and they are uh, doing their job with enormous challenges. Uh, and, with and before we get too far, I should say that we did invite uh, representatives of the Turkmen Foreign Ministry uh, and the Turkmen U Embassy in the United States on the 
the show. Unfortunately, they did not respond to our request. But let me turn this back to you, Luca Ancheski, because what Mohammed uh, has been describing, what Steve is describing, it makes it sound like Turkmenistan is almost kind of like a North Korea of Central Asia in some ways. Is that a fair comparison? Well, it is in terms of the isolation. Uh, obviously, the, the, the geopolitical circumstances when, when North Korea finds itself with two great powers very close are different from Turkmenistan. But if you just merely talk about the isolation, yes, it is true. Um, the fact that Turkmenistan and isolation is self-imposed, the policy of neutrality that they have been implemented since 1995 has been used to insulate the country from foreign influences so that whoever tries to engage with them cannot bring any price tag to, to cooperation offers, which leaves the, the, the regime free hands with, with whatever kind of regime they have. So it is a country essentially isolated. Uh, there are serious constraints to the internal external mobilities of the citizens. There are also um, problems with, with the access of foreigners. Last year, uh, no, I think 2015, maximum of a thousand visas was issued worldwide. So it's a country where people do not simply go through. Worldwide, uh, only 1,000 people visited the country last year then. That's yeah. a couple, two, yeah. three people a day. Well, and most of them were either business, businessmen or foreign diplomats uh, or, or returning documents were visiting families in the country. Right. So it, it's not a country that's got access to uh, ideas coming from the outside. Well, let me turn this back to you, Stephen Sable, because Turkmenistan was a part of the Soviet Union. Russian was an official language, but it seems like uh, Turkmenistan has really sought to keep Russia at arm's length. How has that played out? Why, why has that been such a focus of Turkmen policy? Well, I, one of the uh, reasons I would argue is, is has to do with uh, the economics. Um, being essentially a landlocked country, um, it's going to be heavily dependent upon its neighbors. Um, and so you, you have a situation where if you're talking about the exportation of the natural gas, for example, and other commodities out of the country, um, it's typically utilized bilateral arrangements to, to try and accomplish this. Um, Russia is going to negotiate any sort of contracts or agreements with Turkmenistan that actually favor Russia and might actually diminish uh, Turkmenistan's uh, opportunities. Um, but I think also that there, when the Soviet Union collapsed, one of the things that many of the republics in Central Asia tried to do was to find mechanisms for legitimacy. The system, um, of the, the Soviet system, um, the, the history, the culture, the, the, the concepts behind the Soviet system um, had essentially evaporated. And so the regime attempts to then create a, a, um, a legitimacy for Turkmenistan. And so by keeping Russia at bay, uh, you, you manage to create this, this system by which the, the, the Turkmen state becomes now the legitimate um, actor for people in their lives, the economy, um, sort of the socio-cultural um, construction of Turkmenistan. And in many respects, though, I would argue, and listening to both Luca and Mohammed talk about this, there's almost been a continuation of the totalitarian sort of system where people live what I would call two lives, as they did during the Soviet period. There's their public life and their private life. And you, you heard Victoria talk about this. The private life is where you might be able to get information. But in public, people are very cautious um, about the way in which they interact with the state and the way in which they interact with any visitors to the country. A reminder that you're tuned in to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're talking today about the isolated Central Asian nation of Turkmenistan. We're joined by Mohammed Tahir of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Stephen Sable of the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and Luca Ancheski of the University of Glasgow in Scotland. For more Global Journalists, you can visit our website, globaljournalist.org. There you'll find our ongoing coverage of underreported international issues, including a new series of interviews with journalists exiled from their home countries. You can also check out Global Journalist on Facebook or Twitter, or subscribe to the videocast of this program on YouTube. 
And Mohammed Tahir, I wanted to ask you about a fairly well-known episode uh, about the current Turkmen. President Berdy Mohamedov, and that took place back in 2013. I understand he's a lover of horses, and he was in this big horse race uh, in Turkmenistan with a large crowd there. And at the end of the horse race, he fell off his horse. What? How was that event covered? What does that sort of tell us about Turkmenistan? What What happened after that? You know, we, we uh, after that event, uh, we were trying to uh, actually provide uh, an. Ob- as much as possible, the objective uh, reflection of what happened. So uh, that was a part of a, a, a major event in Ashgabat, and he loves to host an or, uh, organization like that. And also, you mentioned that he loves horse. He he he's seen riding horse in a number of occasions. So that that was, I believe. Uh, was one of the occasions where he could uh, demonstrate his, uh, you know, um, expertise on that subject. So he was doing that, and that was a kind of horse race. And almost close to the uh, to the finish line, you know, uh, he is uh, horse stumbles and he fell down. And then uh, yes, there were lots of people. And on that occasion, yes, uh, the, uh, the that was a live broadcast which stops on the Turkmen State TV. Then there were lots of other people who were, uh, you know, shooting that uh, event. And then uh, so authorities were kind of very sensitive about this particular event being broadcasted or published outside the media. So when event finishes, so they stops <laughs> everyone who were present in the stadium, checks their cell phones and camera and all these things to be able to prevent uh, this picture uh, uh, being leaked. But, you know, there were some people... Uh, so they were like, trying to make sure that people didn't take video or just didn't still have video of the president falling off his horse uh, yes. on their smartphones. Yes. So I remember people who supposed to, uh, you know, depart to various countries immediately after that event, they missed their flight because they were under investigation or under, you know, uh, they, they were questioned, stopped and questioned by the security. So that is one of those paranoid situations that they want to portray the president is just, uh, you know, uh, is a, as a man who is above the ordinary people. He has lots of skills. So, And you see that's why lots of other activities that is shown on TV, him doing Doing like a sports uh, car race or biking or some other stuff in whatever uh, activity that he participates in, he's you know he's always uh, you know uh, 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 announced as a uh, as a winner. So this is part of that. Uh, so you you see that occasionally in a number of other occasions. Well, I think that anecdote is quite illustrative. But let me sort of change gears here and go to you, Luca and Chesky. There has been growing concern about the spread of ISIS in Afghanistan, which of course shares a border with Turkmenistan, especially in the provinces near Turkmenistan. Is this seen as a threat? I mean, how, how is the war in Afghanistan, how has that affected Turkmenistan? Well, the, the, the post-2014 post situation is actually um, affected because there have been uh, continuous skirmishes at the border uh, between Turkmenistan and Afghanistan. I, I don't think it's ISIS related. Uh, I don't think there is a problem of radicalization. I think there is a problem of um, a relationship between Turkmenistan and the Taliban who run the, that area. I mean, the, traditionally, the two counterparts have, get, have had good relationships. Uh, there are pictures of former foreign ministers shaking the hands of the Taliban leaders. We know that there were, were deals of smuggling going on through the years of years. Um, but the, theory, the, the deterioration of the, the, the border situation actually uh, signifies to me that the current government is struggling to having uh, a successful relationship with the Taliban. I wouldn't really mention radicalism as an issue here. It's much more about ter- territory and uh, power. Well, Stephen Sable, in one of your articles, you wrote that Turkmenistan is flawed, fragile, and isolated. And the flawed and isolated parts of that title seem obvious, but what signs are there that this regime is fragile? Um when I wrote that article, it was actually before Niazov passed away. And my concern in Turkmenistan, and it's still a concern that I have um, for Turkmenistan, is there are, are really weak succession mechanisms 
um, in the event that a president um, leaves office, whether due to you know death or, or some other reason. And as a consequence, given Niazov's health issues um, before he died, my concern was that in the event that he left the scene that other actors in the neighborhood, Russia, Iran, uh, certainly, and I also thought Uzbekistan, um, would find mechanisms to actively intervene in Turkmenistan's politics during the succession crisis that I, I um, expected could occur. So you don't see it as being yeah. fragile right now, then? Well, I, I think it's fragile, and it's it's continued isolation, um, and the the it, it's difficult to gauge social dissatisfaction, public dissatisfaction. We we get snippets. Uh, Mohammed does some wonderful reporting um, out of Turkmenistan, and as Victoria was saying, you do get um, some information uh, from people, but they're always very very cautious. So. It's difficult to measure the depth of support for the regime or what might come next in the event that the, the current regime falls. And I still believe, uh, although again difficult to measure, that Iran would potentially have some interests in a friend. I'm sorry, we're losing your audio there, Steve, but I did want to go to you, Mohammed Tahir. Our time does grow short. Corruption is supposed to be a big problem in Turkmenistan. How does that play out in people's everyday lives? How, how does it affect them? Oh, you face them uh, in every stage of uh, your life and day-to-day -day life in Turkmenistan. For instance, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, admit your kid to kindergarten, it starts from right from there. So you have to uh, you have to be able to uh, make some people happy there to be able to get your kid in. Then it goes to school. So you have to pay bribes just to enroll your child in kindergarten. Sure. sure. And then when it goes to elementary school, the the amount again increases. High school, you know, it goes up to all the way to the university. Where in the past we have heard like a kind of a really really big number, big amount of money to be able to get, not only to university, which supposedly free. And then you have to continue to bribe uh, teachers to be able to get good grade or just pass your exams. So it continues. And when your education life finishes, then you have to you know, work. And again, you face the same challenges uh, to be able to get a job, regardless of your skills, how talentful you are. And then you have to do, continue to do the same thing to be able to maintain your job. So it is a kind of part of a day-to-day -day life in Turkmenistan. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA, Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Victoria Clement, Mohamed Tahir, Stephen Sable, and Luca Ancheski for joining us. Our producers this week are Jin Hong Chen and Rachel Foster Gimble. Our visual editor is Alyssa Blyle with multimedia production from Lily Cusack and Jonah McCown. Our audio engineer is Pat Akers and our director is Travis McMillan. I'm Jason McClure. Thanks again for joining us. We'll leave you with a recent clip of President Berta Mohamedov on the campaign trail. He's playing his guitar and singing a song he wrote called Forward My Motherland, Turkmenistan. <laughs> Her dağlar söyü olup atanlar Senin temiz ışın doğrular 